Hello Nigeria, hello Africa. You're welcome to Sports Business with Oru for a Zaga. You're watching Plus TV Africa and we're reaching you live from our studios in Lagos. Today we're going to be talking about the sports industry from the government perspective. As you will know, the sports industry has struggled since the turn of the century, especially following the prevalence of cable television and globalization. Our domestic sports, which should be the bedrock of our sports industry, has been on life support since that time. The federations and the government have taken the easy route by focusing instead on our national teams. And even then, our football seems to be enjoying, you know, very um, little support, very little support, leading to most of the sports ministers being, you know, seen as, um, you know, ministers of football. What, what I should say there is that our football gets the most support from the government, and this is why we have called most of our sports ministers um, ministers of football. Sports is a major driver of economic activity, as well as a creator of thousands of quality jobs. However, it is commercial its commercial power lies in the local industry. In recent years, following government's deteriorating economic conditions, it has become clear that it cannot shoulder the responsibility of funding sports alone. Meanwhile, there has been little success in wooing the private sector to join in the funding of sports, partly because government has been half-hearted about reaching out to the you know, with con convincing initiatives. How does government really see its role in sports development in Nigeria? And what do they expect from the other stakeholders, particularly in the private sector? Joining me via Zoom to shed some light on this is the outspoken former Minister of Youth and Sports, Barrister Solomon Dalong. And if, you, if anybody should know how government thinks about our sports, Nobody should know better than Barrister Solomon Dalong. Okay, so we're going to be speaking with Barrister Dalong, and he's going to be talking about his experience as um, a minister of youth and sports in this country. He's going to be helping us look at what sports the sports industry has been like since he left office, what it was like when he was in office, and what he thinks we should do going ahead you know into the future sports is big business it's a big industry that creates thousands and thousands of jobs and it's very you know contributes healthily to every country's um gdp we're going to go on a short break and when we return mr bryce the long is going to be on the on 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 the hot seat and he's going to tell take us through um what his ideas and his insights are on how we must approach the sports industry going forward. Don't go away. When we return, the business begins. You're welcome back to the program Sports Business with Oru for Ezaga. We're reaching you for plot from our studios in Lagos, and this is Plus TV Africa. On the program today is former Minister of Youth and Sports, Barrister Solomon Dalong, and he's joining us via Zoom. And we're going to be looking at the sports industry in Nigeria today uh, and where we can go forward and how we can go forward, by, um, I beg to say. Now, the thing is that this program focuses on the business of sports. But, Minister, would like to first of all ask you about what your impression has been, um, what your impression was in in, 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 in office about the sports industry and what it has been since you left um, office. What do you have to say about sports industry in Nigeria? Well, the sports industry um, globally is a mega business industry and um, is the second largest uh, employer of labor after the high tech um, uh, industry. And um, the sports plus civilization is likely going to be the next civilization after the digital uh, uh, civilization. But um, in, in Nigeria, sports is still uh, enjoying the status of mere uh, recreation with a uh, lackadaisical attitude from. Um, uh, government 
and um, even poor funding, poor and less funding, um, corruption within the system, uh, polit politicization of the system, and then incompetency. So this uh, sum up together uh, create a monster that uh, beats the growth and development of uh, the sports industry in Nigeria. But uh, for the private sector, the private sector uh, has the zeal uh, to invest in um, the industry because, I mean, they share common experiences with their partners uh, across the globe. So, looking at even the country with its huge, uh, huge population and potential, I mean, the, the talent, the sports talent in uh, uh, Nigeria is the time that is invested, invested and invested. Uh, it is likely to be even the mainstay of uh, driving the Nigerian economy uh, without oil and uh, another non oil um, sector. So, but um, ironically, it's still mere recreation just to service the mental health of the people in government and then the political elite. Okay, you know, I think your take on sports has been. You know, what you have said as part of the sports industry is the right one. You know that. You were the minister of sports. So what can you tell us, you know, um, given your experience in government, that, that, you know, stood, you know, as a hindrance to the development of sports? Yeah, there's corruption. But that is, that's just one part of it. What, what was your view of the federations? What was the role of the federations? What did the gov what, how does the government actually see its role you know, uh, in the development of sports in Nigeria? You were the minister, so well, you should tell us you know, in concrete terms what, what you faced. Well, I, I was appointed when, in, in 2015 when Nigeria was in the session. Yeah. And I'm so I I inherited uh, one of the most difficult um, situation as a minister. Yeah. You know, because um, I had to even uh, go from cap to hand sometimes to little big friends to intervene to even loan and borrow money uh, to uh, host come and train um, Team Nigeria. Yeah. I've said this a couple of times that um, I didn't have the comfort other ministers had in the organization of the uh, Olympics because uh, in 2016 I had to borrow about 15 million from my left minister to find Uber okay. to come and train team, team Nigeria and prepare them for Olympics. Um, I traveled to Rio uh, with my ticket. I bought my ticket. Wow. And um, the first uh, tranche of payment of funding men to uh, train, come, and prepare Team Nigeria came four days into the Olympics. Wow. That was when we had the first uh, payment. So, uh, what I took to Rio basically was um, my effort and um, the support I enjoyed from uh, the private sector, especially like um, late Prophet T.B. Joshua, a passionate um, uh, sports lover uh, who spent most of his funds in supporting um, football and other sports in Nigeria. He was also very instrumental in um, giving assistance and support that uh, culminated into what we considered as the victory 
of returning Nigeria to the medal table in 2016. Okay. The National Assembly voted 400 million for Olympics in 2016. These are public documents you can go and verify. And uh, 400 million uh, cannot uh, even offset the um, uh, tickets of Team Nigeria to uh, Rio. Mm. So I have to even uh, prevail on the then President Buhari for a special intervention that explains why we even could not get money until we got to Rio four days into Olympics before we got the money. Because the 400 million appropriations from the National Assembly uh, could not even do anything. So the president approved another 1.4 billion. So I went to Rio with um, 1.8 uh, billion in 2016. Now, as to the attitude of government, the attitude of government. For all the years I spent as a minister, there have been no time that the government released funds on time. I gave a good example of the National Sports Festival I revived in 2018 after about four or five years. Um, I got the buy-in of the president and the National Assembly member. But Ironically, we couldn't get funds until nine days to the commencement of um, the sports festival that the government released funds to us. Every preparation that led to that success, which Nigerians celebrated as the November of the National Sports Festival, and then the discovery of so many talents that have been abandoned as a result of the uh, lack of national sports festival. I had to use overhead of the ministry for preparation. So every month, if we have money, we take an item. That was how we continued with also the support of the private sector that we were able to conclude the plans nine days before. The festival, the whole government of this uh, money. So the attitude of government is quite like a difficult and discouraging when it has to do with even funding. Okay. And then appropriation. Yeah. Mm. Appropriation is one of the most difficult things, even in a, a sports administration. Yeah. Uh, the ministry will raise its uh, estimates for the year. But on return from the National Assembly, you will go and defend it in the National Assembly. And for me, I never had it good with the members of my committee on sports because the first year I appeared before them, and when I was uh, required to at least uh, provide the board for sacrifice, and I told them I had difficulty in doing that because. I mean, I looked through the budget line items and there was nothing indicating that I could um, pick something elsewhere and give, it, and give anybody. So I advised them that if they wanted me to give them money, they could also appropriate it in the budget. They may even like, they may put like, okay, bribe, 00102, million when it is approved. I will just take it and give them what it is. So I cannot take any budget line item and give them. Yeah. So that uh, created a, a bad relationship. And so all through my period as a minister, uh, any time I appear for uh, budget defense, uh, I only had a very brief time to read the principle and theory of the budget and it is only the farm thing that will continue with uh, other things. So I don't think it has actually changed till today. So, the government is not committed at all. Maybe so except this year that I had, they were able to vote like 19, 12 billion. billion.
Oh, oh, okay, Minister. Okay, here's the thing. Yeah, government understands from what you have said. Government understands that sports is important, and it's not just important as sports. I imagine that, for instance, if I were the Minister of Internal Affairs, I'd be thinking, let's do more sports so that the young people will be engaged. The more engaged they are, the less they are prone to crime, criminal activities. So that brings down crime. I, if I were the health minister, I'd probably say let's do more sports. Because the more active the population is, the less health problems they will have, the less we have to spend on health care costs. If I were in, say, the, the, um, the youth ministry, Keeping your young engaged is very critical. If I was in IT, for instance, you know, sports provides a lot of IT opportunities for young people. There's a whole lot that sports bring to the table that I think is even bigger than the sports ministry. In government, do you think, do you get a sense that maybe like the internal affairs minister or the minister of health or the minister of uh, employment or the minister of works who takes care of infrastructure, do you sit, get the sense that they understand how integral sports is to modern civilizations? Um, you see, my in our Minister of Youth and Sports Development, the Minister has decided over now has three ministers. Uh, and so, uh, that was the ministry I was uh, in charge. I was one of the most traveled ministers to the state. Okay. Because I was always in one, one state. India, both uh, media, maybe I have forgotten to hear uh, those things I did. Okay. And I met some far reaching statements at each time I visit. Okay. I kept telling the governors that they could give me like 20% of their budget. Okay. And I will assure them that insecurity will be an issue of the past. So I, I use this advocacy very well during my, my, my tenure as the minister. So I, let me agree with you that um, the level of understanding and appreciation of sports and its, um, uh, the, the magnitude of um, potentials it holds for a nation, I, I, I don't think it is within the knowledge of many people who occupy the strategic position. And um, you see, some of them knew next to nothing about sports. When I was appointed and I went with this, my very global appearance, mm. a lot of people assumed that I was, I was just a stranger to the ministry. No, I was an athlete uh, when I was young, very good. Um, Sprint athlete with the very fantastic records of my time. Okay. Uh, so I knew so much about the craft. I knew so much about. Um, um, I was a very good uh, long jump athlete too, and uh, high jump. Okay. And so I knew all these things and understood how these things work. Uh, I played football, but I only played it for fun because, I mean, there was nothing you did then except you are celebrated with glucose and uh, they <laughs> celebrate you. You feel, you feel proud. So, yeah, I wasn't a stranger, but my dressing, you see, made me look so naive. And so the uh, sports media, uh, in fact, ascribed to me so many nomenclature. I was even at once referred to as the Boy Scout Minister. Of there, was, there were no names. But they were referring to somebody who had a master's degree in uh, law and who even lectured in the university and produced students who today, some of them are senior advocates in Nigeria. Mm. But I decided to look so naive because I understood the sports uh, architecture very well. Uh, it's more or less like uh, you are going to Syria or Gaza with all different contending interests. Yeah. fighting themselves there. So uh, I, I didn't want it to dress with my suit, which I used to look very handsome in it, mm -hmm. to arrive there and run into the problem of all the monsters and hyena <laughs> that are there. So the truth is that 
majority of people in government do not understand what sport stands for. If they do, like you enumerated, budget of these ministries would have gone into sports development. Yeah. Once, one, one scientific collaboration of this statement you made was during the National Sports Festival. Okay. So the period of two weeks, Grand race in Abuja, Nus died. At the National Sports Festival, there was no single report of any criminal activity. Yeah. Despite the insecurity that, that has been prevalent in this country. That is the magic of sports in dealing with insecurity. Okay, so... Where, during, the, during the National Sports Festival, mm. we produced 45 million years. 45. How did we do that? The government fixed uh, awards for gold. Okay. So, if you win a goal, you have one million. Yeah. And when I was going around, there was a lady from Delta State, a, a, a swimmer, who won five gold medals. Wow. And she probably did her case and told me, the minister, I am a millionaire. Because I have five million now, my state government will give me five million. And I asked her my idea, what will you do with the money? And she said, Oh, I'm going to build a house for my father. <laughs> so the easiest way to produce reward is in sports. Okay, so, so why do we waste waste time on this rhetoric? Yeah. Okay, so you know what you have what you have just said is what you know the more advanced countries of our world uh, have understood for a long time so for instance in the in in in, the, in america in europe you know sports is a, a way to create a new class of wealth um, in society especially among the poor where where they don't have good education they don't have um, any ten, any any uh, interest in education sports offers you a bit like the out-of-school children we have in Nigeria today, sports offers you a different route to education, to wealth, and to fame, and to respect. You know, so I agree with you completely that we need to do something um, about sports in Nigeria. But if the government does not appreciate the value of sports, what then do we do? Um... Well, the way out of it, you see, um, every day we are degenerating, and uh, sadly, that's our, our reality. Uh, otherwise, uh, credible stakeholders in the sector who are passionate about it uh, should come together mm. and then uh, mount pressure on government, just like uh, those in the oil industry have been able to achieve with the issue of the yeah. refinery. But you see, the, the sad situation in sports is that when you have the administrators whose uh, immediate interest is what they benefit, they, they have scattered and, and, and tend to to motivate uh, most stakeholders who have just walked away from the uh, industry. So you have mediocre and, uh, and incompetent elements uh, cutting all over the landscape and then uh, messing everybody up. So the only way out is one, I mean, the stakeholders in sports must rally around and maybe hold a summit, a public summit, just don't involve government. Hold a public summit with the sports uh, uh, media and then 
general or create a, a pressure group, I mean, that would, would mount sufficient pressure on government. Federal government will come to terms with it. Now, this will gain the sympathy and um, support of young people who are the ultimate uh, beneficiaries. Hmm. Because in this advocacy, these positive values uh, and benefits of sports uh, should be emphasized. Hmm. And uh, it is going to stand into the itchy ears of um, the uh, digital natives. Because I'm going to use, I mean, the, the digital uh, space. Yeah. So the digital natives, yeah, the digital natives will definitely key into it. And it will burn like the wildfire of uh, the recent protest. So they will understand. Young people will understand that, look, no, even if I do not go to school, I have the potential of becoming a very wealthy and a rich person. Yeah. And references could be made to great uh, sportsmen and women. Uh, Obtainable in other clients who uh, have been uh, successful. And I give an example of what happened in Kaduna when I was a minister. We went for one of these uh, um, military sports festivals. And uh, a young person came, uh, and he saw people on the truck running, and he was accusing them of, uh, I mean, not doing well. And I don't see him. Can you do He say, I cannot do it again. So we tested him with one of our best. And he gave him a very <laughs> good death. Uh, but he was running with his bare feet. So we had uh, to kick him up and he couldn't run. So they recruited them is that there is an unexpected uh, talent there. Mm. And this is somebody who didn't go to school. Yeah. And he's not, he's not in school. Yeah. So, this is all we are talking about. So, the attitude of our government is, 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 is on wholesome when it comes to so, sports sports. development. And when you go to the National Assembly where the laws would have been made, you know, the problem where we are, where we are today in Nigeria, is that there is no any legislation regulating sports. So sports is run at the whims and car prices of uh, stakeholders. Okay. So, um, Minister, we're going to go on a short break um, to you know, catch our breath, basically, and to give the, the, the viewers to, an opportunity to do the same. When we return, we're going to be talking more about the role of the private sector in sports. And, you know, you've already said government does not really understand sports, but at least you understood sports. Did you try to engage the private sector? And what was the response that you got? And how do you think that, you know, um, government and the private sector can form a symbiotic rela relationship to dis develop sports in Nigeria? Give us a moment. Don't go away. When we return, the business continues. Hello viewers, you're welcome to the second segment of Sports Business with Uru 4 a Zaga. You're watching Plus TV Africa and we're reaching you live from our studios in Lagos. On the program with me today is former Minister of Youth and Sports, Barrister Solomon Dalong, and we've been talking about sports, you know, in Nigeria, how the government sees sports in Nigeria. Now we're going to be talking about how the government interfaces with its stakeholders, particularly the private sector, you know, in, in its quest to develop sports in Nigeria. Hello, Minister. Are you with us now? I'm with you, but I came back very smartly. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so now to the question of the private sector. I remember that during your, your time, there was... Um, there was um, the new MBC code, you know, and, and one of the things about the code that excited was um, the fact that local 
businesses that invest in foreign sports should at least, you know, um, pay or invest 30% of whatever they're investing in foreign sports in domestic um, properties. Are you, do you remember that code, sir? Well, I heard of it. You heard of it? Yeah. Okay, in any case, it was, it was supposed to have been passed in 2018, but it was quashed. It was quashed because too many interests didn't want it, didn't want to, to didn't want it, basically. All right? So now, how do you, how do you guys, um, what was the reception you got from the private sector when you made advances to them to try and support sports? And I'm talking about the big players in the private sector, like the MTNs, the Glows, the, the um, V-Mobiles, the First Banks, you know, the G GT Banks. What, what sort of re response did you get from them? Um, well, the private sector generally has been cooperating. Okay. Uh, to be honest and fair, in fact, they sustain my cinema. Okay. Uh, because, like total, let me, let me begin with total. You see, total uh, has huge investment in uh, football, but uh, every proceed of um, their profit that they invest in sports goes to the continental sports. So I got to know of it and um, I visited them. I engaged with them and got their buy-in. Part of, part of their investment to uh, basketball. Okay. Uh, they invested quite well in basketball development in uh, Nigeria. Okay. Uh, the state government, the state government especially like the southern state, especially south, south state. Um, they are sport friendly. And uh, their attitude to sport development is quite encouraging. Uh, so they are being supported to uh, supporting football and uh, putting their huge investment uh, in uh, um, football development. Now, there are the individuals like in the Southwest Andes. No, it's a cosmopolitan um, zone that uh, football is not strange to it. And so you have even families that have uh, legacies of investment in a, in a sports. So some of them have even diversified their, their support to sports development. And like I mentioned, T.B. Joshua. T.B. Joshua was somebody that was given the Nigerian Football Federation many times they went for competition. Uh, he, he doesn't give less than $350,000. Wow. So, uh, uh, um, we, 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 I enjoyed quite a, quite a good cooperation from them. The University of uh, Ilorum, uh, we signed uh, an MOU with them about the National Youth Games. You know, the National Youth Games produce the caliber of uh, athletes now that we are parading them across the globe. Some of them, if, uh, given the proper support, would have now been given us medals, especially in the last Olympic. Uh, but because of the uncoordinated and unvisionary attitude to sports administration, they all crashed out in their prime. And unfortunately, by net circle, some of them, it may, it may take some quality investment for them to realize their potential. So, on the average, the private sector environment is quite fatal and um, co uh, friendly and cooperative uh, with a very deliberate policy uh, they can be able to contribute and post development in Nigeria will take a, a different dimension did, did you but, uh, their problem 
Yeah. Their problem basically mm. is that there is the absence of a legislation that, you see, like I said initially, that force is a big time business. Mm. So there, there's a need for a legal regime that will define the relationship of the major actors and uh, uh, their investment, how to protect their investment. The invest this is, is, is lacking because it's a big lacuna. And it is this lacuna that encourages and fester all uh, the types of uh, characters in force the administration. Okay, we but talk about corruption. Yeah, okay. But Minister, when you were there, did you try to do anything like that? Did you try to come up with a, a, a way to regulate the industry? Yeah. And to be very honest, you know, I did quite a lot in, in trying to um, activate the necessary legal instrument that would... Um, uh, facilitate sport development, but it, it, it all, uh, you know, it suffered some heavy and legislative gunshot in the National Assembly and did not survive. Mm. Yeah, even um, uh, one of the uh, process, we invested so much in it, we even uh, mobilized, consulted broadly the Nigerian Football Federation Act. I mean, it went as far as to the point of uh, concurrence between the National Assembly because one arm has passed, it's just for the other one to concur. And uh, there was a demand that NFF could not meet. Uh, it became uh, time bar because it dealt with the legislative year at that very critical point. Oh, okay. So I yeah. Did that. I did that. I legislation like the one within my competence, like the national youth policy, uh, which was abandoned for about how many years? I reviewed it in 2019, hmm. and I presented it on the day, on the eve of my departure in the office, because I made sure that it was um, uh, passed and presented since it has to go to the Federal Executive Council. That I got the, the buy-in of the Executive Approval and we reviewed the National Youth Policy, which is in uh, use till there. So, all those things that are within my knowledge and um, within the, my efforts to activate them, I started them. But of course, I'm not alone in it, and so it, it couldn't have been accomplished. Okay, so what do you see of the industry today since you have left? You know, uh, based on your experience and what you have seen your successors do. Do you think things, do you think things have changed? Do you think, for instance, that um, the current minister who got 12 billion, um, um, you know, should have done better at the Paris Olympics? You see, the worst thing that can happen to any human being is to be alive to watch their legacy being dismantled. That's the worst thing that can ever happen to anybody. Okay. I'm a very sad person uh, because all the efforts I put in trying to lay a very solid foundation for sports development uh, have all been dismantled and uh, destroyed while I'm alive. Uh, when I, I returned to Nigeria to the medal table in 2016, we returned with a bronze medal. And in Paralympics, we returned with so many world records, and uh, over 12 medals. So, today Nigeria has gone to Olympics with 12 billion and returned with a, a box of embarrassment and disgrace. Of course, you cannot be a state-based celebration. I became a minister in 2015, 
Nigeria was no, nowhere in any international competition in football. I qualified Nigeria for Wafu Afcon Chan. We went to all this competition and came back with silver medal. I single-handedly been the only Minister of Sports to qualify Nigeria for World Cup without uh, a multi-billion naira presidential tax force, saving Nigeria over 10 billion naira. Uh, to, today, I, I, I watch Nigeria, I mean, missing out in, in, in the World Cup. And even the longest effort, the, the ongoing uh, efforts now has also escalated my BP because, I mean, countries that uh, could not even dare Nigeria are defeating Nigeria. I mean, <laughs> they will be defeating Nigeria. Oh, oh. You, know, you, can, you, don't, you don't expect me to be happy. Oh, okay. I democratized the National Federation and made sure that nobody became a president of a National Federation except he is popularly elected by the Congress of that Federation and is, is a stakeholder and somebody who has passion for that sport. sport. Today it has been revived to status quo uh, ante. They created a, a board of national federation that has every the stakeholder. You have the media, you have athlete representative as a board member, you have coaches, you have the private sector, you have NAWIS. Yeah. All these things have been dismantled. Oh, okay, okay, Minister. Uh, for me, yeah. Okay, so here's what I will do. is lamentation. Okay, so I want you to treat this before we call it a day. Um, you know, most of the ministers that come in, and as a matter of fact, most of the people in, 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 in the industry, in the media, and other stakeholders of sports think that, you know, the national teams are the priority. All right. So even when they talk about sports business, they talk about going to the World Cup, going to AFCON, it's big business and all of that. Whereas in the developed parts of the world, sports business is actually driven from domestic competitions. It is your leagues, for instance, that bring you uh, media rights, that bring you merchandising, that bring you... Um, um, sponsorships and partnerships and yeah in in large in large um um in large deals but locally nothing right nothing is happening locally the mpfl is struggling and what did you do at, when you were in government uh, you know because i i remember that at that time they had some sort of uh, partnership with uh, super sport you know but priority is always given to the national teams whereas the national teams don't constitute up to 5% of the total business um, of sports in any country. Is it, do you think that's something that government understands? Well, we must also understand the sports architecture is uh, a complex. Mm. You see, uh, grassroots sports development, mm. uh, we have a department uh, in the ministries that supervise. Because the role of the ministry is policy making and an implementation body that also supervise. So these departments provide this uh, grassroots sports development to ensure that, I mean, it is kept within the policy of um, the government. So it is the responsibility, basically, of the uh, National Federation okay. uh, to handle the issue of, yeah, it's basically the, the responsibilities. They go for funding, they, they get funding, the time contract uh, support to develop uh, uh, sports at that uh, level. All that the ministry will do is to ensure that accountability so okay. that the confidence and trust of uh, the private sector is not um, uh, destroyed. Yeah. So the, the local leagues completely is um, within the mandate of the National Nigerian Football Federation. Federation. Okay. And uh, they, receive, they, yes, they receive points from FIFA in respect of that. FIFA even gives them money to uh, construct um, football pitches, specialized football pitches across the country. So uh, the enemy of Nigeria, uh, the enemy of the 
common people of Nigeria is corruption, but is the goal of the political elites and leadership. So, uh, you, you discover that this disparity in terms of who is what is good and bad. For the poor people, corruption is responsible for impoverishing them. But then for the political elite, it is corruption, which is their God, that is making it possible for them to live the lifestyle they live. Okay. So this yeah. is what destroyed grassroots sports uh, 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 development. Developing. And you can only get effective sports, grassroots sports development with democratically elected presidents of national federation. And the, the minister or the ministry should have no business in the election, selection, appointment, recruitment of a national president of a federation, the business of the Congress. Okay, 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 Minister. On a, on a final note, if you had to go back to the Ministry of Sports, what would you do differently? Well, uh, if I will go back to the Ministry, mm. what I have done differently before, because what I did in the Ministry, there was nothing I did usually there. Mm. Everything that I did was just to scatter the table for the good of all. Mm. Uh, and so, if I go there again, uh, I would first be preoccupied with the issue of ensuring that there is a, a legislation uh, in place so that I can be able to recruit and mobilize the private sector. Mm. I will ensure, I will ensure that, I mean, elections into the National Federation must enjoy the support of the Congress, those in that federation, so that credible national leaders who are interested in the development of their federations emerges as president, so that at least when I sit at my table, mm. I will be preoccupied with permission, not to be settling for us. Okay. Um, it's been nice having you on the program. That's what, by the way, your... your one of your, your current, um, the current Minister of Sports um, has, prom has um, vowed to do, to try and see that you know, people who run the federations from the next cycle of elections are people who are dedicated and passionate about the different sports that they would like to superintend. It's been nice having you on the program, and hopefully we can engage again in the future. There's so much to say, and one hour is not enough to say everything so i'm sure I'd, I'd like to reach out to you again to to further you know um uh, teach us what you you learned while you're in office so that even those who are aspiring to the position in the future can learn a thing or two thank you very much for honor, honoring our invitation well thank you too for the minister i, I doubt if he has the courage to do what he has said yeah <clears throat> Oh, you see. And that is because, because unless you will have to go back to democratization policy, yeah. which the documents are everywhere in the ministry, that's the only salvation uh, he will have. But for the political will to do what he has said, I, I think he's only trying to defend himself because of what has happened. All, all right, Minister. Thank you very much. And that is it for the program today. Um, next week we have another exciting show for you and I'd, I'd um, encourage you to, to look to make it a date as well as to invite your friends um, to be a part of that. Sports is big business. I can't say that enough on this program and it can create opportunities for not just you but your friends and family. For all of us, it's very critical to nation building and to nation, national development. Until we meet again next week, this is me, Urufo Izaga, saying be productive, be good, and stay safe.